Let me show you one feature, one little detail that sums up the impact the Mark II had when it arrived in 1959. I'm not talking about the beautiful grill, or that long bonnet, or the wire wheels. It's back here. It's this badge, Dunlop Disc Brakes. And though it wasn't just Jaguar showing off, you see, these were the same disc brakes that had brought them victory at Le Mans. And Jaguar were worried that because they stopped the Mark II so quickly, mere mortals might just pile into the back. That might sound twee today, but back in 1959, this technology was mind-blowing. Good enough, in fact, to put the Mark II in a league of its own. Today, Jaguar may be locked in a constant struggle with its German rivals, BMW, Mercedes and Audi, but let's look at how the competition stacked up back then. This is the Mercedes, a 220 saloon. Mmm, racy. This is the BMW 2000. It's getting there, but power-wise, it's still very much in short trousers. And this is the Audi. They really weren't trying at all. They hadn't even bothered to exist in 1959. But not only did the Mark II drive better than everything else, it also looked better than everything else. Quite a tricky double whammy to pull off. Even more so when you consider that in 1959, Jaguar didn't even have a styling department. There were no professional style gurus employed to draw these glorious shapes. Sir William Lyons, Jaguar's founder, would in the day work in the office, doing the paperwork, running the company. And then of a summer's evening, he'd work on the prototypes here in his garden, using the light, just looking to see how it fell on these gorgeous curves. And best of all, the head gardener of the time says that all the local boys and girls would line up along that wall and just peep over and watch him work. The 3.8 could hit 60 miles an hour in eight and a half seconds. That was faster than all the Germans, faster than many of the purpose-built sports cars of the day, faster even than some modern S-type jacks. And best of all, it was accessible because it was so cheap. In fact, if you take into consideration just changing fashions, it wasn't the Jaguar of its time at all. It was the Subaru Impreza. And Aston Martin DB4 came in at 3,200 quid with 300 brake horsepower. But you could have a Mark II Jaguar 3.8 with 220 brake horsepower for 1,600 quid. Some people didn't even pay that much because the Mark II was the car of choice for Britain's villainous getaway drivers. Roy James, who was the great train robber's getaway driver, was very particular about his Jag Mark IIs. He'd always steal a 3.4 rather than a 3.8 just because he preferred the handling. Not a lot of people know that. The Mark II ran for most of the 60s, but by 1968, it was all over. And not such a bad thing, really, because by then, Jaguar had been swallowed up by British Leyland, and predictably, the BL monster was doing its bit to screw up everything. So it had its eight-year run, like most cars, but for me, it remains the ultimate Jaguar. It wasn't the first time they'd used this kind of design or this engine, but as a package, the Mark II became the definitive Jaguar saloon. It might not have the ultimate knockout glamour of the E-Type, but the way we look at Jaguars today as fast, affordable, classy sports saloons was defined by this car.